Okay, you want to go ahead and test it? Okay. All right, hit that little button on the top. You might need to do it. How about now? That's yeah, good. wow. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there a big truck outside? <laughs> I wish you each a blessed Sabbath rest. Oh, 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 oh. Welcome to New Smyrna Beach Sabbath School class. Amen. 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 In this class, we use the adult Sabbath School board room. Does everyone have a board room? Good. Studying lesson number five. How many of you appreciate when someone sends you a birthday card on your birthday or texts you a nice note or maybe emails you something? Why do we like that? We like to be remembered. Even when you're sick and you're out of work or whatever, if you come back and somebody says, I hope you feel better, you know, it makes you feel so much better that somebody noticed and cared. Where do we get this instinct or need to want to be remembered on trying times or a birthday. Where does this come from? Is it egotistical? Is it self-centered? It's biblical. Remember Genesis 1, 26 and 27? In whose image were we created? God's. In whose likeness were we created? God's. That's where we get it from. Why are we here today? <laughs> to celebrate the birthday of the world. Is that not correct? Yes. Sure. Yes. So God too wants to be remembered. God wants for us to feel that He is relevant. Amen. And that is why you and I enjoy receiving a birthday card or a text. I'm writing out a text. That's another story. <laughs> or we enjoy receiving a nice little message, email message. Yeah. Life is all about being relevant. We like to be relevant to someone. Certainly our family, although it doesn't always work out that way with family members. Our children, our church family. So, It is not egotistical or selfish or self-centered to want to be relevant because we get this instinct from God. I see the book of Job as God trying to make a member of the human race relevant. Now, Job was concerned whether he was relevant to God. Now that's a problem. Because if we believe in God and we are a little shaky about whether we are relevant to God, 
That is not good. The very reason that Jesus came to this earth is because the entire human race is relevant to God. Amen. The question is, did Job understand that God wanted to make Job relevant for God? I'm not playing a game of semantics here. Did God know who Job was? Yes. Yeah, he was a member of the human race that Jesus would eventually come and die for. But he wanted for Job to understand that that's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is, because, is to become relevant for God. And Job did not get that. Do you and I get it? We're quick to say, oh, I, love, I love Jesus. We just sang it. I love Jesus because he came and died for me. Okay. Now the question is, what's the next step? How much do I appreciate what Jesus did for me? Am I ready to become relevant for God? And until we understand that and recognize that that's the purpose of life for us on this earth, Jesus is not going to be able to come back. Ever since Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, Adam and Eve and the entire human race has become helpless. The Apostle Paul understood that. And that's why he wrote Romans 6.16. Let's turn to Romans 6.16. Romans chapter 6 verse 16. chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, they became 100% slaves to Satan. God came up with plan B. Jesus came to this world, died for the human race, and now Paul in Romans 6.16 introduces <coughs> option A. Option A is that who would like to read Romans 6.16? If we became slaves to Satan, what is the solution to that? God has now what? Given us an option. But first he did something very interesting, which is announced in Genesis 3.15. Remember Genesis 3.15? When God, Jesus speaks to Satan, Eve, and Adam. And he says, I, speaking to Satan first, I am going to put, P-U-T, very important word, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed, and you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That's the new covenant. Amen. So when someone asks you, or starts talking about the old covenant and the new covenant, you can find out very quickly if they understand what they're talking about. I say, well, which came first, the old or the new covenant? I asked that of someone once. And they say, are you dumb or something? Of course the old covenant came first. And so I said, well, does your Bible include Genesis 3.15? When you want to uh, discuss the Word of God, you want to not get into an opinion session. You want to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God speak for itself. Isn't it inspired? Amen. Don't get into an argument with someone. It becomes an opinion session. So, Jesus says to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Why did Jesus use the word put? Had Jesus forgotten to not include something when he 
and the God who created Adam and Eve, well, we forgot to put something in them. So we have to go back now and correct our mistake. What was it that Jesus forgot to put in Adam and Eve when he created them? Nothing. But they chose to become what? Self-dependent instead of God-dependent. So now Jesus had to put what? He had to put the ability for them to what? Hate sin. Which they no longer have. Is that biblical? Yes. Turn to Romans 8, 7. Romans 8, 7. Ready? The carnal mind is enmity against God. And not subject to the law of God. And even if it tries, it cannot be. That's the way I am. God introduced this idea in Jeremiah 17.9. Remember Jeremiah 17.9? The heart is a deceitful thing and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what we became when Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. So God finds a solution. And Jesus says, right there, Genesis 3.15, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Now we have the ability to what? Respond to the love of God when we see it manifest. Do you like that? Yes. Because unless that option were available, Romans 8, 7 would doom us. We would be doomed. So, who would like to read Romans 6, 16 for us? Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Thank you. You like that option? Yes. We didn't have that option until Jesus said in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to put in you something that you lost when you chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. Because we became slaves to Satan when we made that choice. But now, based on what Mary Jane just read, we have an option. We have an option to become a slave to whom? God. Isn't that beautiful? If I choose to become a slave to Christ, what is my reward? Would you read verse 22 of Romans 6, please? But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. You like that? Yes. I like option A that Jesus presented, the new covenant in Genesis 3.15. That's what he's talking about. I now have the ability to what? Despise sin. Because I've become in love with Christ because of what he did for me. Under what circumstances? Romans 5, 6, when I was helpless and ungodly, Jesus came to this world and what? Died for the ungodly. Right. Right. Do you like that? Yes. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Jesus came to this world and died for us. Do you like that? Yes. Romans 5, 11. Here's that word enmity again. Who would like to read Romans 5 about it? Not only that, but we also rejoice in God for our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Right, I'm sorry, I apologize. <coughs> would you read verse 10 first? I apologize. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Well, we were what? Enemies. What do enemies do to each other? Do they hug each other first and say, may the best person win? Yeah, no. Huh? Well, enemies
enemies to kill each other. Yes. So, it is very important to understand that what we're studying in the book of Job is that God wants to make all of us, even Adam and Eve, after they sin, including Job, He wants to make us relevant for Him. Amen. For Him. Once we accept this concept or this premise, then Job's experience will make sense to us. Let's turn to Job chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. Job chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. When you're there, say ready, and uh, I will read it. <coughs> Beginning with verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, the word Satan in the first two chapters of Job is speaking of the adversary. Okay? That's the way the word Satan is used in the first two chapters of Job. The adversary. And the Lord said to the adversary, Have you considered my servant Job? Do you know what the word considered means in Hebrew? I already know. Huh? But I already know. Considered. He knew already. God knew already. In modern language, it means, have you decided to zero in on my servant, Job? <laughs> yeah. Look up the word considered in your, in your concordance. That, that's why. I got it. For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God, revering God, and turning away from evil. Then the adversary answered the Lord, Does Job revere God for no motivation in particular? <laughs> Isn't Satan clever? He's actually stupid. He's talking to God. Does God would know. <laughs> Verse 10, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. 11, But put forth thy hand or withdraw thy hand now and touch him and all that he has and he will surely curse thee to thy face. And 12, Then the Lord said to seven, to say to the adversary, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. And we know the rest in verses 13 to 22. But that's not where it ends, does it? We're not, that's verse, chapter 2 is not part of our study. But we know that Satan came back and said, Okay, now let me at him physically. And God said, Okay, you just take care. And after all of this, what do we learn from one of our scriptures this morning? In Job chapter 3, verse 1. After Job, afterward, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day, his birthday. Why do you think he cursed his birthday? He was wishing he'd never been born. Never existed. He no longer felt relevant. And when we don't feel relevant, we do some horrible things.
Did Job understand at this point that what God was trying to do was to make him relevant for God? Not at this point. But did he ever curse God? No. His wife suggested that he do and die. But he never did, did he? No. He cursed his birthday. It's important for us to understand what's going through Job because the purpose of life since Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent has not changed. There's only one purpose. And that is to let God make us relevant for Him. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I like the story and I like that Jesus came and died for me, but I don't want to be that relevant for God. I don't want to be that relevant that Job was relevant. Give me something else that I can witness to God. But no, please, I don't want to be that real. I know some people, sincere people, they go to church on the right day of the week. Pay a gross tithe. Does the Bible say we should pay a gross tithe? No. Just pay a tithe on the leftover. These people write checks every time that their donation is needed for something. In one case, they're financing the tuition for a young person to go to a Christian school. But out of that same mouth, I've heard them say, I don't want to go through the time of trouble. Put me away and resurrect me, but I don't want to be alive when Jesus comes. But God won't give us more than we can handle. We're coming to that. <laughs> It is important for us to understand what Job's wife and his three misguided so-called friends did not understand. And I'm going to keep repeating this. The purpose of life, since Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, is to become God-dependent. Which means that we're 100% focused on allowing God, as God sees fit, to make us relevant for Him. And one of the problems is that we think that the purpose of life on this earth, some people call it the great controversy, is between Satan and us. That is not biblically correct. The great controversy is between Christ and Satan. So when calamity strikes poor health, the loss of a loved one, the loss of your business, what should we think of? Why me? That's what Job said. Why me? And then he goes out of his list to God and said, Look, these are the things I'm doing. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? God is looking for a people that will graduate to the next level of understanding of what the purpose of life is on this earth. And that is your and my great, great privilege to understand that. Let's take a look at Job chapter 7, another scripture in our lesson for this week. Job chapter 7, beginning with verse 13. Job is feeling sorry for his circumstances. And he says in verse 13, If I decide to 
lay on my bed, get a little rest. What do you do to me, God? Verse 14. You give me bad dreams. You give me nightmares. So, why wouldn't I want to just suffocate and die rather than go through these pains? Verse 14. I'm just wasting away. Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't you put me through enough? Now a very interesting statement in verse 17. What is man that thou dost magnify him, and that thou art concerned about him? Does that remind you of another passage of Scripture? Who would like to look up Psalms 8, 4 and 5? Psalms 8, 4 and 5. What is man that thou art mindful of him? In other words, what is it about men, or man, the human race, that you even think of it? Think about them. You, the God of the universe, that is in charge of everything, that make, can make anything happen. What is a human being that you even think of that human being? What relevance, what importance do I have that you even think about me? In other words, why are you focused on me and letting all these things happen to me? Why don't you pick on someone else? <laughs> enough is enough. Who would like to read Psalms 8, 4, and 5 for us? What is man that you are mindful of him, and that the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. What do you think of that? Wow. <laughs> Why is that a wow, Mary Jane? Well, I mean, it's right here in Job, and then years later, it appears in Psalms, and and... It's it's the Lord's coming, and and He's gonna He cares for us. You like that? What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. We mean everything to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Is to say, uh, we mean everything to Jesus. That's why he's here. That's why he went through everything he went through to save us from sin. He cares about us. He loves us. What love? What is man that thou art even thinking about without mine? And the son of man. Not only thinking about us, but what? The Son of Man that thou visitest, that thou visitest man with his own son. What if one of the candidates running for president would send you an email and says, I would like to come over tomorrow Sunday and have lunch with you? What? What would you do? You would be emailing everybody on your list to say, guess what? Who's coming for lunch? Wouldn't you? Not with these My wife told me something funny, funny, funny about this presidential race. She said, I saw the funniest thing. Someone sent me an email. Like, These two candidates are a divorced couple. Yes. <laughs> and they're fighting over us. These <laughs> are their you know, so um. They don't understand that all of us want to go and live with our grandparents. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>
So, so far, up to verse 17 of uh, chapter uh, 7, we have an incredible awareness of what God thinks of us. 18, that thou dost examine him every morning and try him every moment. Why does he examine us and try us every moment? 